Good to be here this morning. Thank you for your prayers. I feel better than I have in quite a while. Lord. Praise you, Lord. When God deals with us, He does it to change our lives. Sometimes we uh, aren't real excited about that. Mm -hmm. but once we get through it, we can look back on it. Not only do we understand better, but we're usually grateful. Amen. Because of what God has done Amen. in bringing us closer to Him. If you brought your Bible, turn with me to Acts, the seventh chapter this morning. This is Passion Week, so it would be the last week of Jesus' earthly life. Acts chapter seven. If you'd like to stand, you're welcome. I'm going to start with verse number 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
Gracious Father, we thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you for the comfort and the strength of your spirit. We thank you for your healing power. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to touch people's hearts and lives today, that you would be glorified, that your people would be encouraged and strengthened. And, Lord, that we would be seated in heavenly places with you. We ask, God, that you would touch those that are not here this morning, that you would heal their body, that you would refresh their spirits, that you would glorify yourself in their homes. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Glory to God. To find out what kind of man Stephen was, we need to turn back and look at uh, chapter 6, and I'm not going to read it all to you, I just want you to think about it. In chapter 6, in verse 5, that's where he's first introduced to the church and the scripture. And what had taken place is there was some dispute going on in the church. And some of the people were complaining because they felt that the widows were being neglected in the daily needs. The disciples called the people together and told them, You pick seven men to take care of this. The disciples had plenty to do. They needed help. There was a situation. The group came together and they picked seven men that could help take care of the needs because the need was real and it needed to be taken care of. So here in verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. They chose six others, but I'm only going to deal with Stephen this morning. We now know that Stephen is a man that is full of faith mm -hmm. and full of the Spirit of God. And the multitude, when they came together, or, or the group of people, they chose him because of who he was and what they saw in him. They recognized that he was a man of faith, that he was filled with the Spirit, <coughs> and they chose him to help take care of the need that was there. Down in verse 8, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Mm -hmm. Now we see something else about Stephen. By this time, he's become a well-known preacher, a miracle worker. And he is effective for the kingdom of God. By the time that we get into chapter 7, he is now having to defend himself. Before the council, or the Sanhedrin, but he clearly knows what he's talking about. And we're not going to read chapter 7. It's a lengthy chapter. And it's mostly all of Stephen talking and explaining because they were upset with him. But he knows the word of God. And as he speaks to this council, he explains all the things that went on and things that they knew or should have known. And then we get down to verse 55. In verse 55, 
In verse 54, it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Because some of the things that he said, they didn't appreciate. It was the truth. And he told them about Jesus and about how they had crucified him. How they had rejected him. And how they were not about to listen to God even though as religious people they claim that's exactly what they were doing and by the time they get down here to verse 54 they couldn't take anymore and in verse 55 it says but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Yes. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, I've never had that kind of a vision. God has shown me something many years ago that uh, I think about occasionally, but I, I never saw anything like that. What a sight he must have saw. Yes. Being able to see him in the heavens, seeing the glory of God and seeing Jesus standing Sometimes I think we take the glory of God for granted. Amen. Come on. And maybe that's why the church is in the situation, the condition it's in these days. And I wonder what will it take for us to see the glory of God again? Or maybe for the first time. In our text, in verses 59 and 60, Stephen is being murdered. And the reason he is being murdered, murdered is because he was a man that was full of faith and power in the Holy Ghost. And he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He talked about that they needed to repent and how they were resisting. And the people didn't like it. But also in our text, while he is dying, he prays that God would forgive them yeah. for what they are doing. Thank God. Now, me knowing me, <laughs> and you knowing you, we get irritated pretty quickly. And we don't forgive very fast either. Think about it. And that's the truth. Especially if you're having a bad day already. If you're having a bad day, you need to stay home. Don't get on the road. <laughs> we are right. <laughs> need I say more? <laughs> but Stephen, who has broken no laws and done nothing wrong, is being murdered and in that process 
He's asking God to forgive them. He saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. The heavens were open. There's no doubt in my mind that God heard his prayer. Absolutely no doubt in my mind. I don't know about you. But if I could see heavens open and the glory of God and Jesus standing, I would have no doubt I was in communication. Amen. Nope. We should believe it now anyway, but Amen. Don't we, we have a doubt. My question, and it's not an easy one, is can we pray like this when we're going through things like that? How willing are we to pray and ask God to forgive those that are doing unspeakable things to us? Or, do you, or just things that we feel that are unfair? Can we honestly pray, or will we honestly pray, or is it possible for us to honestly pray that God would forgive those that have hurt us deeply and do it with such purpose and passion that our intercession on their behalf reaches the throne of grace? I mentioned that this would be the last week of Jesus' earthly life. I'll get to that, I hope. How do you think God answered that prayer? The scripture don't tell us. So you're going to think about it. What they did was out and out sin. Sin against God, sin against Stephen. Now we'll come back here in a little bit. But I'd like for you to go with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke, the 23rd chapter. Verse number 34. Jesus is on the cross. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I wonder if Stephen knew about his prayer. We don't know. But what Jesus said was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now they knew that they were crucifying Jesus. They knew that they had nailed him on a cross and put a crown on his head and beat him until he was unrecognizable. But they didn't understand what they were doing. And Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them, because they don't get it. Now, I don't know if you think or have thought about it. How was 
this prayer answered? Never think about it. My brother, in all his great wisdom, sent me a text yesterday and said, who is responsible for the death of Jesus? What's your opinion? So in my great wisdom, I reply, every human being that ever lived, Amen. because we have all sinned. Amen. And it's because of our sin that Jesus hung on the cross. Yes. He said, I lay my life down. No man takes it from me. In other words, I willingly yes. give my life so your sins can be forgiven. Yes. So when Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, they don't understand what they're doing. He needed to die in order for us to be forgiven. They wanted Jesus dead and out of the way because he was a problem. Mm -hmm. In spite of that, Jesus prays for their forgiveness. Yes, he did. Still in human form. They didn't like him. They didn't want him around. And I'm sure all every one of us at some point in our lives has felt unwanted and unloved. And during that period of your life, you pray with passion for God to forgive those that don't like you. How do we respond? Think about it. We're in Luke. Turn with me to the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter of Luke. Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. In other words, that was his goal. In verse excuse me, 51, it says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went, excuse me, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Jesus often did that. And taking the village ram, uh, for instance, any time that they were going to go into a city, they would send people ahead and make a great deal of fun. Yes. Get things prepared, get things ready, so when the people came into town, all was ready. Pretty simple. Verse 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And the short and simple of it is, they rejected him. The people of this village didn't want him. Wasn't interested. Go somewhere else. Now we, looking back, would think that's not very bright. But they were living in that era and Not everybody was convinced that Jesus was the Lord of glory at that point. But here's my point. Verse number 54, it says, When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? Now, Elijah called fire down from heaven twice, and each time uh, 50 men were consumed. They were, they were killed by the fire that came from heaven. That's what Peter and John have in their head. They thought, Elijah did it. 
bless God. We'll take care of this group of people for you, Lord. How dare they? Who do they think they are? You want us to do it? Think about it. When you're being rejected, kind of spirit do you have? Boy, if I could call fire down. Verse 55. He is Jesus. But he turned and rebuked him and said, ye know not what matter of spirit ye are of. James and John were willing to call down fire and destroy an entire village because they felt that Jesus had been snuck. And, and, and he probably was. It says they rejected him. Or they didn't receive him, rather. So in the eyes of James and and John, the Samaritans had it coming. Instead of realizing they didn't understand, just like when Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't understand what they're doing. Jesus came change our lives. And the people in this village didn't understand that, or at least not at that time. So James and John felt that they should all be destroyed or killed because of their rejection. They didn't receive Jesus. They didn't, they didn't acknowledge him. And in their minds, they need to pay for that. Very quick to judge. And very slow to forgive. Sounds like human nature to me. How easy it is for us to justify ourselves. And we do. Jesus rebukes them for their lack of love and compassion. He says, you don't even know what kind of spirit you have. That's not me. And the world still doesn't understand why Jesus came or why he's coming again. But in spite of that fact, Are we willing to call down fire because they have rejected him? Verse 56 says, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So they went to another village. But my point is, this is the reason that Jesus came. To forgive. Even when we think there should be no forgiveness. I am not picking on James and John. I think we're just like them. And there are times that we deal with things or go through things <clears throat> and we think where's the justice in this mm -hmm. or this isn't fair or whatever it is we say 
Turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Jesus has died. He's been put in the tomb. <clears throat> Verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has, has sent me, even so send I you. Even if you wonder where in the world I'm going. Jesus says, Peace be unto you. Jesus speaks peace to us in the unfairness. Jesus speaks peace to us in times of struggle and heartache, trial and uncertainty and oh Lord, what's going on kind of days in our lives. But Jesus doesn't stop there. After that, he says, I'm sending you just as I was sent. What was Jesus sent to do? We just read it. He come to forgive. We think of all the miracles and things that Jesus did. And we're quick to want to be sent to do what Jesus done in those instances. But Jesus also was sent to forget. The only way man can be restored is by forgiveness and Jesus came to forgive. We are to share the gospel, face the heartaches and the suffering, to make known God's will, and to offer pardon or forgiveness. Sit with the same authority that Jesus had. When James and John said, Lord, would you like us to fall down fire like Elijah? They understood authority. And how you want to deal with that, that's up to you. The point I'm trying to make is that Jesus said, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. When Jesus came, he had the power and the authority to do what needed to be done, whether it was healing blind eyes, raising the dead, casting out devils, or forgiving sin. And all throughout the Gospels, you will read that people said, who does this guy think he is to forgive sins? Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. When Jesus went into the wilderness after he was baptized by John the baptizer, the Bible said that the heavens opened and 
and a dove was sitting on him, like as a dove, and he was driven in the, in, into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. Jesus is telling us that we need the power of the living God in us to be effective and able to do what he has called us to do. We can't do it without his spirit. It's impossible. Look at verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. I know this is a controversial verse. But Jesus spoke it. And I want to share it. We all know and understand that we can't forgive our loved ones for all their sins and their loved ones be saved and go to heaven. We understand that. We know that. Amen. We're not even trying to. It has nothing to do with nothing. The only way you can go to heaven is if you repent of your sins and ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Amen. Otherwise, you're not going. You're not saved. Right. You have no eternal life. But that's not what that scripture is talking about. When Jesus said, whosoever sins ye remit or forgive, they're forgiven. Now you're going to have to work this out for yourself however you want. But when Jesus was on the cross, he prays, Father, forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. When Stephen is being stoned for preaching the gospel, he sees heaven open and he prays, don't hold this against them. Lord, lay not this sin In other words, Father, forgive them because I have. That, that might be a little different than what you think or how you want to deal with it. But in Acts 7 and verse 60, He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That's what he meant. Yeah. Now, we pray sometimes half hearted prayers. I don't think this fits in that category. No. He is dying and he knows it. They are determined to kill him. Because what he said offended them. Offended them so bad, they were out of their mind with rage and they wanted him dead. So, can we forgive sins against us? If somebody sins against us, can we forgive them? We hold grudges for far less. Come on. And we hate far more. Come on. And I know Christians aren't supposed to hate, but uh, wake up one of these mornings with a bad spirit and tell me it ain't happening. Mm -hmm. We're still in human flesh and we still need to bring it under subjection. And that means we still have to deal with things we don't like. And one of the things that we have to deal with is being able and willing to forgive those 
that have wronged us. Yes, come on. And I use extremes here because it's pretty hard to fight with. The extremes, Jesus being crucified or Stephen being stoned. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covereth all sins. Last one, and I'm going to stop. 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Yeah. We can't have our children and grandchildren get into heaven because we've, we've decided to forgive them right. for their sin against God. Right. But can we forgive people that have sinned against us? What kind of spirit are we of? Not easy. Very difficult, tough setting in scripture. But I think Jesus is coming soon. And the Bible says, without spot or wrinkle. And I ain't wrinkle every time I kneel down and pray. My point is, God is trying to get us to the place He wants us to be. Because that's where He wants us. Yeah, we've been wrong before, we're going to be wrong again. And we can either let that destroy us, or we can ask God to forgive them, and God will change you. Yes, He will. Are they forgiven? You're going to have to deal with that yourself. What I want to deal with is the attitude of your heart. The change that God will make inside of us when we forgive, knowing that we have every right to be upset with what has happened. Stephen had every right to say, God, send the fire down and consume them. They're killing me. And I'm your servant. I'm done. If you will stand. of Jesus' life. He knew he was going to die. And he still took the time to teach Peter and John about some mercy and about some grace. Because they needed to understand what was inside of them was not what he wanted inside of them. Father, we thank you for your word. Sometimes it seems to scrape a little deep. Lord, we thank you for your word that causes us to look at ourselves and realize that we're not all that you have called us to be yet. As you help us to see inside of ourselves and to realize that we need you more. We need to be men and women full of faith and the power of the Holy Ghost. Directed by your steps. By your spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would move in our hearts and in our lives and that you would help us to become the men and women that you called us to be. Lord, that we would reflect your grace, your mercy. And 
what people see in us, they will know of a certain that came from you. We ask that you will bless this church, that you will glorify yourself in it, that you would be worshipped and honored with whole hearts. Bless each one that's here today. Do a great work in their hearts. And I ask it in Jesus' name. God bless you so much. Thank you for coming.